Welcome to chapter 51, population ecology. So by the end of this chapter, you should be able to describe how individuals within populations are distributed geographically, describe the relationship between survivorship, fecundity, and other life history traits, calculate the growth rate of a population, compare and contrast exponential and logistic growth, and describe how and why population size changes over time. So when we talk about populations, we mean a group of individuals from the same species that live in the same area at the same time. So population ecology is the study of how and why the number of individuals in a population changes over time. How and why? How and why. So population ecologists use different levels of study so they might look at morphology or behavior or physiology to be able to figure out how organisms are able to survive and reproduce in particular places. And so we have to think about Dar Darwin's population level thinking and recognize that it's the variation amongst individuals in a population that helps us understand how the population changes over time in response to habitat. So let's think about, um, let's think a little bit about population and range. Um, with this kind of lizard here, Zatoka vivipara. So range is the geographic distribution of a species, meaning where it's found in the world. We should remember that a range is dynamic, um, meaning that it changes, and it can change due to abiotic factors like weather or humidity, um, or biotic factors like parasites or predators or competitors. So ranges are dynamic and they change over time. And so you can look at different geographic scales for ranges. So globally, if we were looking at where Zatoka vivipara is found, you would say, ah, yes, it's found throughout Northern Europe and Asia, okay? Um, at a regional scale, if you look within the British Isles, you can see that it's found, you know, kind of in a widespread pattern, but it's missing from some areas. And then if you look locally, you can see that it is clumped, the distribution is clumped, so maybe this is a habitat where the, where the lizard can live, and the other places are in habitats where the lizard cannot live. So population density refers to the number of individuals per unit area, so it could be random. That means that the position of each individual is independent of the others, right? So they just both, they all just land somewhere and they are wherever they are. The distribution could be clumped. So there could be some reason why they are clumped together. Like for example, there might be good habitat in some spots and bad habitat in others, or it could be a social organism where they always live in groups. The habitat, uh, the abundance could be uniform. So there could be negative interactions between individuals. So the individuals may be territorial and they might not want another individual to come close to them. So they end up evenly spaced in the environment. So there are both proximate and ultimate causes that contribute to the pattern of distribution of organisms. So some of the proximate causes can be things like physiological and behavioral mechanisms. Um, so behaviors that, that cause them to either gravitate towards one another or, you know, avoid one another. Um, or physiological limitations that cause them to gravitate to a particular location versus another location. Um, ultimate causes include evolutionary adaptation. So over time, um, the different um, groups have adapted to live in particular ways. We will talk a bit about a metapopulation throughout the next, this lecture and the next couple of lectures. So a metapopulation is a population of populations, and the populations are connected by migration. Okay, so we will also be talking about demography, and demography refers to the number of individuals that are present in a population, and so the demography of a population is going to depend on births, deaths, immigration, and emigration. So when you have birth and immigration, meaning individuals coming into a population from somewhere else, the population is going to grow. Um, if you have death or emigration, meaning individuals leaving the population for somewhere else, then the population is going to decline. So demography studies the factors like um, birth, immigration, death, and emigration to determine the size and structure of populations over time. So in order to understand the future demography, we can, well, we can tell the future demography based on a couple of things. So we need to know the age structure, meaning the number of living individuals of each age. We need to be able to figure out how many individuals are likely to survive from one year to the next year. 
we need to be able to figure out how many offspring are produced by females of each age and how many individuals are likely to immigrate or emigrate. So if you have a population that's made up of mostly young individuals with high survival and high reproductive rate, then you would expect the population to increase over time like this. If the population consists of mostly old individuals with low survival and low reproductive rate, you would expect the population to decline over time, right? So this is why it's useful to know the age structure and the survival. Um, so to be able to get information like this to predict um, a population's demography in the future, we will use something called a life table. So a life table summarizes the probability that an individual will survive and reproduce in any given time interval over the course of its lifetime. So, um, Zotoka vivipara are named vivipara because they give birth to live young. And we can monitor the population with a life table and use that to calculate the number of individuals that survive each year in each particular age group and figure out how many offspring each female produced. So you can see here, this is the age class. So you can have age zero, meaning from birth to one year old, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so let's say there were a thousand individuals born at the beginning. So they all survive so far. Okay, so n sub the x is number of survivors. By the first year, by the end, you know, by, by the beginning of the first year, 424 survive. Beginning of the second year, 308, 158, 57, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we can calculate out survivorship, right? So this is the beginning. So there's 100% survival at the beginning when they're born. Okay, by the, by the first year, the survivorship is 0.424, right? Um, the survivorship from birth to two years old is 0 0.308. From birth to three years old is 0 0.158, et cetera. We can also figure out age-specific fecundity. So um, we can see here that, well, little babies don't have any babies. Um, One-year-olds, not very many of them have babies, but a couple of them do. Two-year-olds, um, some can have babies, right? By the time they get to be five, six, or seven, they have the maximum number of babies, okay? So if we can work out the average births per year per female, um, so we can figure out that females um, are, let's see, most, let's see, females who are two years old are more, are more likely to survive than three, four, or five-year-olds, and they have the most number of babies um, for, per female that's alive. So we can see that the maximum period of time that individuals are reproducing um, is between age two to four. Okay, so age class is the number of individuals of a specific age, right? And so, like we talked about, the table was made up of following a thousand Hansatoka vivipara that were born in the same year. And so we say that they're a cohort, so they're a group of individuals of the same age that were followed through time. Survivorship is the proportion of offspring that survive on average to a particular age. And we can recognize patterns in survivorship and then compare populations in terms of their survivorship. And so we will create a graph called a survivorship curve. And so that is a plot of the logarithm of the number of survivors versus age. So we've noticed some kind of patterns in the shapes of survivorship curves, right? So type one curve involves survivorship throughout life being rather high. And then eventually they hit an age where they just physiologically break down and they die. Okay. So this is like humans, right? Um, like we have relatively low death rate all the way through our entire lives until we just get really old and we die. A type two curve is throughout their lives, they're equally likely at any given point to die. Okay. So this would be something like a songbird where there's predators all over the place. There's egg predators, there's hatchling predators, there are adult, adult predators their whole life long. Type three curve results um, from when you have very high death rates early in life and high survivorship after maturity. Um, so you get that pattern with a lot of plants where it's very, very hard for the little, the little seedlings to get started. But once they get over a certain size, that tree is just gonna live forever. You kind of get the same pattern frequently with some kinds of top level predators. So the predators, when they're little baby predators, um, are vulnerable to predation. But once they get over a certain size, nobody messes with them and they just live until they die a natural death. All right, so I'm not gonna do this right now, but this is a coming attraction for when we meet on Wednesday. Um, you will plot the survivorship curve based on the life table.
Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about reproductive rate. When I talk about fecundity, I'm referring to the number of female offspring produced by each female in the population. Um, age-specific fecundity is the average number of female offspring produced by females in each age class. So well, let's talk about the, the age-specific part of it first, meaning not just the total number of offspring produced, but the number of offspring produced by zero-year-olds, one-year-olds, two-year-olds, three-year-olds, right? The reason we're looking at the number of females that females produce is it's just kind of a, it's easier to track female reproduction than male reproduction. And um, it's easier to track one sex at a time. So uh, we just use, you know, females producing females and presume that there's an equal number of males producing males somewhere else. All right, the net reproductive rate is what we use to in indicate whether a population is increasing or decreasing in population size. So if immigration and emigration are not a significant um, you know, source of population change, then um, you would presume that if the net reproductive rate is greater than one, right, each individual is replacing, each, each female is having more than one female, then the population size is increasing. When the net reproductive rate is less than one, meaning each female is producing less than one female, then the population size is decreasing. Um, so if you have a female and she puts all of her energy into making lots and lots of offspring, she is not going to have the same amount of energy left over to maintain her body, right? Like her immune system um, or nutrient stores or to grow uh, or other things that are going to increase her survival. So there is some um, kind of a balance that the female needs to make between, between maximizing fecundity and maximizing survival so that she can have the, the most babies in her lifetime. Um, so an individual's life history is going to describe how they allocate resources to growth, reproduction, and other activities that they need for survival. Okay, um, So I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. But life history includes traits like survivorship, you know, how likely they are to survive one year to the next, age-specific fecundity, how many babies do they have each year of their life, age at first reproduction, and growth rate. And the life history of a particular group of organisms is almost always shaped to maximize the individual's fitness in its environment. So all life history traits um, are along a continuum. So generally, you tend to find organisms that have very, very high fecundity, tend to grow quickly, reach sexual maturity at a young age, and produce many small eggs or seeds. Okay, so that would be, um, I'm sorry, something with high fecundity. Okay, many offspring, small offspring, grow fast, small body size. Um, because they're growing quickly, they don't necessarily need to be able to d resist diseases or fight predators, and they live for a relatively short period of time. Okay? Alternat alternatively, on the other end of the continuum, you have organisms with very high survivorship but low fecundity, so they put all of their resources into growing big and staying alive. And they have relatively few offspring, but the offspring they have um, invested a lot in, so they're very large. They tend to mature late, right? So usually you can have bigger offspring, um, and you know, if you have a, if you yourself are bigger, um, and they have adaptations to allow them to, to live for a long time, like disease resistance and predator resistance. Okay, so now let's get into the math of it. So the overall growth rate of a population is referred to as change in population size per unit time. Um, so that's delta N per delta T. So delta is that triangle. Delta just means change, right? Um, okay, so population's overall growth rate is going to be a function of birth rates, death rates, immigration rates, and emigration rates. So the change in the population size over the change in time is going to be the number of births minus the number of deaths plus the number of immigrants minus the number of immigrants, right? Because births and immigrants increase population size, death and immigrants decrease population size. Um, usually, uh, we don't really know if immigrants or immigrants are coming or going in most animals or plants. So if we make a model in which immigration and emigration are not occurring, we get this simple model in which we have um, that the population's overall growth rate or change in population size is going to be the number of births minus the number of deaths, right? All right, so let's look across years here. So let's just say we have all of the things in here. 
we'll use the big model here with the immigrants, emigrants, births, and deaths. So in 2014, this is what we have. So what's the delta N over delta T? It's four. Is it four? Yeah, it's four. 24 minus 20 plus 20 minus 20. What about 2015? I think it's four. Yeah. What about 2016? Oh, it's four again. 2017? I, I can't do math because I'm a dog, but I think it's four. Why do you think it's four? Because the other ones were four. Yeah. Okay, so you can see there's a bunch of different ways in which you can end up with the same overall population growth rate um, by altering these four variables, okay? All right. So, um, again, assuming no immigration or emigration is occurring, um, then the population's growth rate is going to be the number of individuals in the population times the difference between the birth rate and the death rate per individual, okay? So this is the number of births minus deaths per individual times the number of individuals in the population, right? So this is the number you're starting out with um, times birth minus death. So the difference between the birth rate and the death rate per individual is called the per capita rate of increase, or little r. Wait a minute, we just had a little r. That was the coefficient of relatedness. I know, I know. I didn't, I didn't give things the names that they have. It's just another little r. Oh, that's so confusing. Well, just remember that r can be two things. Okay, fine. All right, so to look at this again, um, the change in the population size over time is going to be due to r, which is births minus death, times n, the number of individuals in the population. So that's called the per capita rate of increase. So what's per capita? It means per each individual in the population. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if there are more births than deaths, then the population is growing. So if there's more births than deaths, what happens to r? It's bigger than 1. Yeah. If there's more deaths than births, what happens to r? It's smaller than 1. Yeah. So if there's more births than deaths, then r times n is going to be you know, a positive number. It's growing. If there's more deaths than births, r times n is going to be a negative number, so it's shrinking. If births equal deaths, then r is going to be 0. So 0 times n is what? 0. Yeah. So it means that the change over time is 0, meaning that the population is not changing over time. All right, so um, if... So the measurement we just did, delta, R, delta N over delta T, is a way to determine the population changes over a specific time span, right? Um, but usually what people like to do is determine the population growth in an exact period of time, right? In, like in the here and now. And so the way that we can kind of smooth over a large slope to be able to get an exact number is to use calculus. And you don't need to know calculus to do this, just know that we're going from delta n to delta t because we're referring to, instead of a, a change over a time span, we're referring to an instantaneous growth rate. So dn dt equals r, um, the per capita increase in population size, births minus deaths, times n, the number of individuals in the population. All right, so um, when, so when, R does not change over time, but the instantaneous growth rate increases. Um, as the population increases, you have exponential population growth. So when the birth rates are as high as possible and the death rates are as low as possible, you're going to get a maximum level of R. Um, and when you hit your maximum R, that is called the intrinsic rate of, of increase, or R max. Okay. All right, so I'm going to show you some examples of this. So you have some species that breed at a really young age and produce many, many offspring. So they have a very high R max. Okay. Um, so like fruit flies and weedy plants can make lot can grow. The population size can grow really, really fast. Um, in contrast, you have some species that take a really long time to mature and they have very few offspring per year. So they have a very low R max, meaning um, the fastest they can they can increase in population size isn't very fast. So like giant pandas and palm trees. Um, have very low R max, right? 
their their best isn't very good, right? Their fastest growth rate is not very very fast. It's important to note that R max is whoops R max is a property of a species, so R max is not going to change. Giant pandas aren't suddenly going to be able to reproduce quickly, right? They just have the low R max that they have. Okay. All right. So the R max doesn't change for a species, but the instantaneous growth rate or R will tell you what the population doing is doing at an exact moment in time. Okay. So R max is the maximum that they could, that the maximum fastness that that species could grow. R is always going to be less than or equal to R max. Okay. So the actual rate at which the population is growing, births minus deaths, is is it can't get more than R max. R max is the maximum, right? So R is going to be less than or equal to R max. Um, and usually R is much less than R max because conditions are rarely optimal, right? Um, there's usually competitors or predators or food limitations or whatever, and R is often much less than R max. All right, so exponential growth curves are J-shaped, like J, right? And um, R is a constant, right? But exponential growth adds an increasing number of individuals because, um, as, because N gets larger and larger, right? So if R is 0 0.02 and N is 1 billion, um, over 20, bil 20 million individuals are added to the population in just a year. Okay, um, remember because it's R times N. Um, so if you have a very low population size, um, then the number of individuals in the population will increase slowly, right? Um, so if you just have N equal to just 100 individuals, then just two individuals are added in each year. All right, so this is just showing you what it looks like if you have a very low R, or low R, or moderate R, or a high R, right? And so this is the increase. So for example, um, e. coli tend to have an extremely high R, like 59, right? That's not even what their R max is. It's just their average R value, births minus deaths. Um, the ciliate peacodatum tends to have a moderate R of 1.6. Uh, flower beetle um, has a low R, right, of 0.10. A domestic cow, 0 0.001. And a beech tree would be very low, 0 0.00075. So exponential population growth is density independent. It means the kind of growth a population is going to do in, in terms of the number of individuals in the population. Um, when, yeah, when the number of individuals in the population doesn't limit how big the population can grow. So you can get exponential growth if you just happen to have a few individuals that colonize a new habitat with all sorts of resources, and then those individuals can grow like crazy, right? Um, you can get the same thing happening if you have some kind of a catastrophe and, and most of the individuals in the population are killed, leaving just a few. Um, so, and under those circumstances, individuals can grow unchecked without um, being affected by, you know, other individuals in the population. But exponential growth doesn't continue indefinitely. Eventually, the resources start to run out. And when the population density gets really high, the population's per capita birth rate decreases, right? Um, so, you know, as each individual gets fewer resources, they have fewer babies and their birth rate goes down. Also, as each individual is crowded, it can affect their mortality and they will die faster. And so as a result, you know, B minus D, less births, more deaths, the, the R becomes smaller. And when this happens, we call this density dependent growth. Density dependent meaning the density affects the ability of the population to grow. We have a letter called K, carrying capacity, that represents the maximum number of individuals in a population that can be supported in a particular habitat over a sustained period of time. So K is the maximum number of individuals that can live in a particular, a particular spot. All right, let's look at these here. All right. Uh, let's eliminate some choices here. So what's K? That's carrying capacity. Yeah, that's carrying capacity. What's N? Population size. Okay. So then two of these re relate to a rate of increase, and two of these relate to growth in population size, right? Yeah. 
All right. So what's our max? Oh, that's that's the intrinsic rate of increase. It's how fast a group could increase. Yeah, like that's how fast a species could increase if it was left unchecked. All right. So what else do we have? Okay. So then we have per capita rate of increase, right? Yeah. So that's R. All right, what is DNDT? That is, well, wait, let's do the other one. Okay, what's delta N, delta T? Okay, that's the change in the population size per unit time. All right, and what's the other change in population size? Mm. Or capital rate of increase? Mm. No. All right, we have change in population size per unit time here, and then we have instantaneous growth rate over here. Okay, so it's instantaneous because we use calculus to figure it out. I did just give away all of these guys over here, but this is the more detailed explanation that goes with each of these names that I just said. Okay, let's talk about logistic growth. Okay, so before this, we were talking about exponential growth. Exponential growth is the kind of growth that happens when there is not a problem with the density of other individuals that interferes with the population's growth. Okay, um, so if you have a population of size n that's below the carrying capacity, then you'd expect the population can keep on growing. But as the population um, size gets closer and closer to k, the carrying capacity, the growth is going to slow down. And so you can see that the population's growth rate should be proportional to um, a particular calculation, k minus n divided by k. Okay? So the rate at which a population can grow isn't just r times n, but r times n times this figure here, k minus n over k. And that's called the logistic growth equation. Okay? So it's an equation that takes into account the effect of other individuals being around. All right, so what happens when n is small? So if we just look at the k minus n over k part, we'll say k is like a thousand and n is little. Oh, I hate when you draw fractions like that. Well, I know. I couldn't draw it the other way on my on PowerPoint. So it's k minus n divided by k. Okay, so k minus n divided by k, and k is big and n is small. It's kind of just like k over k. Yeah, it's kind of like k over k. So what's that? I don't know. I can't do calculations. I'm a dog. Didn't you just do a calculation? Don't ask. All right, so that's close to what number? That's close to 1. All right, so if that's close to 1, um, then it's like rn times 1, right? Yeah. So what does that mean? Is the population growing fast or slow? It's growing fast, like exponential fast. Okay. All right, so if n is very small, then k minus n over k is going to be close to 1, and the growth rate is going to be high, right? So the population is going to grow in that J-shaped exponential growth pattern. What happens to growth rate when n is large? Okay. Let's just say that k is still 1,000, but n is 900. Well, like, okay, so it's going to be like a k minus n is like 100 over like 1,000. So it's going to be like a really small fraction number. Yeah, a really small fraction number, okay? All right, so then what will happen when that's multiplied by rn? Oh, it'll make it a smaller number. Yeah. So when n is large, k minus n over k gets smaller. Okay, so that's 0.1. So if you multiply this by 0.1, this number will get smaller. That means the population size will go down. What happens to the growth rate when n equals k? Oh, it's zero. Zero, right? So the change in pop. So what happens if you multiply r n times zero? It's also zero. Yeah. So the change in the population size is zero, meaning uh, it doesn't change. Okay. So growth stops. The population size stays the same. Okay? So just think about that a little bit. 
So when the population is small um, compared to the size of the carrying capacity, then the carrying capacity, which is like the limit to how many individuals can live there, is really far away and the population grows fast. When n is large, right, when n is close to the same size as k, um, then you, the population is close to the carrying capacity and the population growth rate stops, or not stops, but gets very slow, gets slower and slower and slower as n approaches k. And then when n gets to be the same as k, that means the number of individuals in the population has reached the carrying capacity. And so then this equals zero, and this means that the growth in the population will stop at this point. So that is the list logistic growth equation. All right, when is the population most likely to exhibit rapid growth? Not the first one, right? Not the first one. When n is approaching k, that means it's close to the carrying capacity and the growth slows down. Um, what about when k is large? I mean, that sounds good, but we don't know how big n is. All right. What about when n is small and k is large? Oh, that one sounds good. What about when both n and k are large? Oh, that's bad. That means the population size is close to carrying capacity. What about when the n is large and k is small? Oh no, something terrible has happened in that population. Yeah. So what's the right answer? N is small and k is large. Oh, here's your hint here. Yep, when n is small and k is large. So this is a picture of the kind of growth pattern that you'd expect using the logistic growth equation. So at the very beginning, n is very small, and this is k right here. So n, here's n, and here's k. n is small, and k is large, so you grow very, very fast. You get this j-shaped growth. You get to this point, and n gets closer to k, and you grow a little slower. n gets closer to k, you grow a little slower, and slower and slower and slower, and eventually when n equals k, you stop growing entirely. Okay, so um, we would say that logistic growth is density dependent. So the larger the population size, the slower you grow. Um, <clears throat> hypothetically speaking, density dependent growth has three stages. At the beginning, you have rapid exponential growth. Then the growth begins to decline and then the growth rate reaches zero. Um, so we can see this happening in lab experiments. So we have a couple of ciliates here, paramecium caudatum. They're pretty big, so their carrying capacity is quite low. Very few of them can live in this little petri dish. Um, and you can see they, at first they grow rapidly, and then eventually they level off like this. Um, there's a second species, paramecium aurelia. When they're housed alone, they are smaller, so more of them can live in the same space. So, but they have the same pattern. So they start out growing exponentially. They actually overshoot their carrying capacity and then return to the carrying capacity. Okay, so population sizes can change as a result of both density independent and density dependent factors. So density independent factors can be things like, you know, the weather, um, humidity, temperature, right? Abiotic factors. Okay, so density in, the independent factors tend to be abiotic. And those kinds of things are going to change birth rate and death rate regardless of population size. So if you get like a freezing cold, it doesn't matter if you're close to K or far from K, it'll still kill individuals, right? All right, density dependent factors are factors that change in intensity as a function of the population size. And density dependent factors tend to be biotic. Um, so things like um, disease or predation or competition can uh, decreased survivorship and fecundity, okay? And that's what causes, when you have a logistic population growth, the part at the top of the curve where n starts to approach k, that is functionally, if you looked, you know, kind of on the ground at the individuals in the population, the reason why they start to stop, they, sorry, the reason why the population stops growing is because individuals start suffering from disease, predation, and competition, like that. All right, so density-dependent factors can be intraspecific, meaning within a species, like competition amongst individuals of the same species for access to food, or interspecific, meaning competition between species, uh, or sorry, interactions between species, like predation or parasitism. Um, <clears throat> so here's some dens density-dependent factors that limit population size. 
So competition for resources, you know, like a bunch of tree saplings are competing for light. They might be competing with other species as well. Uh, disease and parasitism that can affect health and stress. Uh, predation, toxic wastes, right? So if you are something like a fruit fly, the more babies that are there, the more waste products they produce and the worse the environment is for everybody. Uh, social behavior. And so individuals may be territorial and so not very many of them can live in a particular space. Um, so things like dominance behaviors and other kinds of stress mediated behaviors can suffer um, when you get high densities of individuals. Okay. So which of these statements about regulation of populations is not correct? Uh, A, density dependent factors usually involve changes in the abiotic environment. No, that's density independent. Okay. Density dependent factors change as intensity in intensity as a function of population size. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, density independent factors alter birth rates and death rates irrespective of the number of individuals in the population. Wait, what? Density independent factors um, alter birth rates and death rates irrespective of the number of individuals in a population. That doesn't sound that wrong. Okay. The logistic equation is designed to see how density dependent factors stabilize a population around carrying capacity. Hmm, that one sounds okay. Uh, changes in the abiotic environment will alter carrying capacity. That one could be true. Like, you could have like all the plants die and then, then the environment carries less of the herbivores. Yeah. So which of those things is not correct? Um, A, I think. That was the one, yeah. Yep. But the rest of the statements are true. So um, when we talk about population dynamics, we're referring to changes in populations over time. And so a classic example of population dynamics are the snowshoe hare and lynx in northern Canada. We know exactly how many snowshoe hare and lynx lived in different years because people were very big on fur trapping um, for many years. And so they could just measure the number of, um, of lynx and snowshoe hares based on pelts sold per year by the trappers. Um, so you can see first the number of hares increase and then the number of lynx increase and then the number of hares drop and then the hares increase and then the lynx increase and they drop, right? So you have this, this lag or you have this cycle, first of all, of number of hairs per kilometer squared, and then following it, you have a cycle in the number of links per kilometer squared. Um, I should have mentioned the hairs are herbivores and the links are predators that eat the hairs. So there's always gonna be more hairs than links because a lynx you know, needs more hairs to live. Um, and then the lag, uh, the cycle itself is a 10 year cycle, but the lynx tends to lag a couple of years behind the hairs. So people have looked at what factors control the hair lynx um, population cycle. And there's a bunch of different hypotheses. The first one is called the bottom-up hypothesis, which is that the cycle of the hairs and the lynx is controlled by the food availability for the hairs. The second is the top-down hypothesis. And this is that the hair lynx cycle is controlled by the predators, by the lynx eating the hairs. There's an interaction hypothesis, which says that there is a combination of food availability and predation that control the cycle. And then the null hypothesis is that the cycle is not controlled by predation, food availability, or both. So what they did is they took three plots that are unmanipulated controls. Then they had one plot in which they put an electric fence around the outside that excluded the links but allowed the hairs to come and go. So this is a plot with no predators. They have two plots in which they put extra food for the hares, okay? So the hares have been supplemented with extra food. And then they have a third um, kind of a treatment in which they have a plot with the electric fence that keeps the links out, but, and, but they also have the extra food, okay? So if the bottom-up hypothesis is supported, what results would you expect to see? Well, 
if you give them extra food, then you would expect it would affect the cycles, right? Yeah. If a top-down um, hypothesis is supported, which results would you expect to see? I guess if you cut the links out, that would affect the cycles. Okay. What about the interaction hypothesis? You would expect that plot without the links and with the extra food to be different. Yeah. What about if the null hypothesis is supported? I guess you'd expect all the plots to look like the unmanipulated control plots. Yeah. All right, so this is what we got here. This is basically one cycle. Um, and so we are comparing each of these, the density of hairs compared to the control. And so the number one represents that the that the treatment is exactly like the control plot. Um, so if it's larger than that, then that means it's, you know, that it's different from the control plot, okay? All right, so we can see here that without the links, there is some effect, right? Um, in which you have, um, oh, this is the, the no links plot over here. We can see that it is slightly larger than one, okay? So that, um, that causes the hairs to cycle a little bit. What about the extra food? Yeah, I guess that caused a little bit of cycling. What about if you did both? That caused a lot of cycling. Yeah, that caused a lot of cycling. So what you end up finding is that if you manipulate both predation and food limitation, you have a greater effect on hair cycling than either factor does independently. So likely as not, it is a combination of food availability and predators that drives the cycle of, um, of the hairs. All right, I told you I was going to talk about metapopulations, right? So, um, a metapopulation is a larger population made up of small isolated populations. Um, so you can see here, we have lots of isolated populations in the larger population. Um, and the glanville fritillary is an endangered species of butterfly found in Finland. They tend to occupy patches of habitat within a metapopulation. Um, so Ilka Hansky and others determined the number of glanville fritillary breeding pairs in each patch within a metapopulation. And um, over time, within the, each population within the metapopulation will eventually go extinct, but then it'll become recolonized by other groups. So populations, individual patches, might blink on and off over time, but overall you end up with a stable number of individuals, um, provided that you don't do things like, you know, take these empty patches and make them into like a, an apartment building or something like that. All right, so check out these age pyramids in Sweden and Honduras, okay? So how do the current age structures of the two countries differ from each other? Well, like with Sweden, you can see there's lots of older people. Yeah, there's lots of older people. There's like kind of the same number of people of each age up until 65, and then there's less because they, they die in. Yeah. What about the Honduras? There's lots and lots of little people, like little children, and then they get less and less as they get older. Yeah. All right, so you can see underneath each of the colored plots, there's these kind of tan bars, right? So that is our prediction for what's going to happen in 2050. So how does Sweden look in 2050? It looks about the same, but maybe a little more. Yeah, maybe a little more. What about the same? What about the Honduras? Lots and lots and lots of people of all the different ages. Yeah, much larger population size, right? All the way up and down. Okay, so when we talk about age structure, we're referring to the proportion of individuals that are of each possible age. And the age structure of a population can have a huge impact on the population's growth over time. So this is how we look at human population structure. Okay, so we can kind of plot out individuals of each cohort, males and females. So each co cohort is a five-year period of a person's life. Um, and so what you tend to see is that the age structure of a population tends to be uniform in a developed country and bottom-heavy in a developing country. Okay. Um, and so because you have this recent rapid population growth in developing countries, 
um, we have the expectation that overall population size is going to increase very, very, very dramatically in these nations um, just over the course of the time that we're all alive. And so part of the reason why you get that kind of bulge going up the, um, the survivorship or the um, age structure in a developing country is because of increased survivorship. So more individuals are able to survive at each stage. Um, but another part of the increase in population size comes from an, a kind of a paradox. So um, although you have a decrease in average fecundity, the populations now have more young women. So the overall birth rate is going to be high. So like in the past, each woman had many kids, right? But in the present, even if each woman has fewer kids, there's a lot more women. So you end up still with the same high birth rate. Um, so we would say that these populations have momentum or inertia. Okay, so because they have a lot of young people now, they're just going to have a lot of people of all ages in the future. Um, and this combined with high survivorship um, makes it so that population increase just has to happen. Um, so this is looking at human population increase over time. So it took from the origin of Homo sapiens until the year 1804 to reach a population size of 1 billion, over here, 1 billion. It took another 123 years to reach three, uh, 2 billion, and then an additional 33 years to reach 3 billion, 14 years to reach 4 billion, 13 years to reach 5 billion, and then 12 years to reach 6 billion, another 12 to reach 7 billion. So as of November of 2017, there were 7.6 billion people on Earth. Uh, I haven't looked for 2020, but you can see the shape of the curve, right? So human population increase is going to have huge effects. It's going to cause habitat loss and species extinction. And as we overpopulate the Earth, we're going to end up getting a decline in human living standards. But we know this can also lead to political instability and acute shortages of basic resources. And so we have one encouraging trend, and that's that the human population growth rate has already peaked and is beginning to decline. So since 1970, the growth rate in human populations has been dropping. Um, between 1990 and 1995, the worldwide growth rate averaged about 1.46% per year, but now it is at 1.2%. Um, so we have a um, division of the UN of the UN that um, makes projections for how human population size changes over time. And they, you know, can make three different projections based on different rates of fertility. So um, if we have high fertility, medium fertility, or low fertility, which correspond to 2.5, 2.1, or 1.7 kids per woman. Um, so replacement rate is the birth rate at which each woman produces exactly enough offspring to reproduce herself and her offspring's father. And right now, the UN projects that replacement rate is 2.1. Um, you'd expect that like you have to have two, two kids to replace yourself and your spouse, right, or your partner. But because um, there is some mortality in women before they can have kids, then the replacement rate is, is calculated on average as 2.1. So when fertility is at the replacement rate, we say we have zero population growth, or ZPG. All right, so this graph is showing the projections for human population growth rate with the three different birth rates. So in 2050, what will be the human population size if birth rates remain the same? Which one is that? Well, I guess that's at high rate. Oh, my goodness, that's almost 11 billion people. Yeah. What about if birth rate is dramatically reduced? Like... 8.3 8 billion people. Yeah. Okay. So if the, like I, like uh, the dog just said, if the fertility um, if the if the average fertility of the world stays about the same, the population will be at almost 11 billion by 2050. Um, so that is a 50 percent increase over today's population. The low fertility projection predicts that the total human population will be just over 8 billion and will have peaked. So that is a little bit more encouraging. So the future of humanity is going to depend on how many kids each woman living today decides to have. And there's lots of factors that can contribute to that. We do know that, um, you know, that if women are free to decide whether or not they have kids, 
um, and whether women are educated affects the number of kids that they have. So educated women um, tend to delay having children and have fewer children. And so the world population over the next few decades is going to be heavily influenced by how much access women have to education and also reliable birth control methods. Also overall economic development and access to quality health care. So when we design programs to save species threatened with extinction, uh, conservationists can draw heavily on these concepts and techniques from population ecology. So when we want to do this, we need to collect and analyze demographic data like age-specific survivorship and fecundity um, in order to save endangered species and also to apply to other kinds of population-based problem solving. All right, so we're going to do this together as a class. So I'm going to skip this for now. So we can use life tables like these to predict the future of a population. So by altering life table values, you know, plugging in different values for survivorship and fecundity at the different ages, you can figure out what parts of survivorship and fecundity are sensitive in particular species and make conservation plans. So many endangered species have high juvenile mortality and low adult mortality and fecundity. And so you might want to focus on protecting those vulnerable eggs and juveniles. And then in other species, the fate of the population is very sensitive to increases in adult mortality. And so you can focus re resources in those species on protecting the adults rather than the eggs or juveniles. Um, sometimes the kinds of population projections we get from life table data can be too simplistic. And so um, we need to have more complex models to include things like storms, fires, or disease. Um, we also need to think about metapopulation dynamics. And so not just um, model each individual population, but model the interaction between the populations. So successful metapopulations, um, each subpopulation has more individuals in it and they occupy a larger area and they tend to be close to the other neighboring populations. They also can um, tend to be more genetically diverse. So you need to have those things to have your metapopulation succeed. Um, in many instances, it's not possible to have a large continuous protected area. And so a lot of kind of cities have done something different and instead they'll have a lot of smaller tracts of land that are connected by habitat corridors so that individual um, organisms can migrate between patches. So you find all sorts of cool habitat corridors in different cities like um, tunnels and overpasses so that deer and large animals can pass through or some cities where you have like a lot of migration of amphibians or smaller animals will have these tiny little like kind of um, flat like drain pipe looking things that allow the animals to pass under roads. Um, so to save a threatened metapopulation species, you have to make sure that just because a piece of the habitat is unoccupied, you can't get rid of it because that may be home for a future population. Um, and so if you have a population that's lost in a preserve, you should keep the habitat maintained even without the population there because it could be colonized later. Um, it gets even more complicated to try and preserve metapopulations with climate change because um, you know, the changes in temperature and precipitation are already altering where some species can live. So hopefully you learned in this chapter the, the number of individuals and populations change over space and time. Um, we talked about distribution and abundance and then looked at demography um, and how that affects population growth. And we talked about how population growth can be applied to looking at human populations and population dynamics, which informs how you would conserve populations of animals.